Good afternoon and welcome to today's program and webinar, part of the highly acclaimed series of webinars that ACP, the Association of Continuity Professionals, presents for its members. For more information about ACP, visit www.acp-international.com. My name is Ed Goldberg. It's my honor to host today's webinar. My thanks to Jim Brennan and ACP's headquarters staff at ADG in Albany and our good friends at Continuity Housing for their roles as webinar experts who work behind the scenes to ensure that these webinars happen flawlessly. And a big thanks to our webinar series sponsor, Continuity Housing. Continuity Housing guarantees pre-negotiated hotel rooms at substantial savings for the critical employees of larger and mid-sized companies in order to, to help prevent a business disruption in the event of a crisis. They've created a patent-pending guaranteed employee housing program which secures and protects hotel rooms for critical personnel and their families if needed while saving companies significant expense. Continuity Housing has a 100% success record with their deployments and each member of their team has at least 10 years of experience in the hotel industry. For information on receiving a free 30-minute consultation about your deployment housing needs, visit continuityhousing.com or leave a comment in the survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. This and previous webinars are recorded and they're made available to AC members on the ACP website. And help us out if you would. If you have an idea for a webinar topic, please send it to staff at acp-international.com. Our guest speaker will be taking questions at the end, so please post them during the webinar in the question box in your control panel throughout the presentation. We'll get your response to any questions that we aren't able to answer now because of time. We're thrilled to have with us today ACP's Molly Latham. Molly is a longtime ACP member, serves on the ACP National Board. Molly has extensive first-hand experience managing the hiring process for business continuity professionals. Whether you're hiring or looking to be hired, you'll find this valuable. Her presentation describes the criteria used to best screen candidates and end up with a manageable number of people to interview. You'll learn the cardinal rule of resume screening, general things to look for, and both essential and nice to have attributes. Finally, you'll be introduced to a screening worksheet that helps to objectively and consistently evaluate resumes. And if time allows, she'll also discuss some fundamentals of candidate interviews. Molly Latham has been an independent business continuity consultant since 2014. She assists clients with business continuity program assessments, business impact analyses, plan development and testing, and business continuity training. She was previous, previously the manager of business continuity for Southern California Edison. She left the company's disaster recovery program and performed a number of business continuity studies, including risk assessments and business impact analyses. She and her team helped IT develop and exercise their business continuity and IT management plans. Molly has an MBA from Pepperdine, is a certified business continuity professional, and is a member of the Business Continuity Institute. She's the immediate past president of the Los Angeles ACP chapter, and she's a delightful person. Please join me in welcoming Molly Latham. Good afternoon, Molly. Well, thanks so much, Ed. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm delighted to give this presentation, and I'll just head on in. Um, so the reason that I um, came up with this topic is I've had a client recently that had an opening for a senior business continuity professional, and um, I had had quite a bit of experience with the interview process and the screening process, so I thought this might be something helpful to present to our ACP community because we often have openings and we need to um, fill them, and there's a, a process you can institute that will really be helpful to you to really get the best person for the position. So. Here's what we're going to talk about, what you do before you post um, consistency, how important that is, what you want to look for in candidates, uh, what are the attributes, the really critical things and the things that are nice to have but not really essential, other things to think about, how to screen them. And um, my idea is to do something like a matrix that really allows you to have a a methodology that is um, something that you can defend that makes sense, it's common sense. So you want to write a detailed job description and 
you want to um, make it as you know filled out as possible. And then there are lots of venues at which you can post the position, and you want to get you know as wide a distribution as possible because you want to get as many people as you can to apply for the position. And if you're in a big like I I'm in Los Angeles, so we have you know lots of people here. It's probably not necessary for an employer to pay relocation assistance, but if you're in somewhere more remote, you might not be able to get somebody local and you might have to pay relocation. So you need to determine if you're going to pay relocation. And then um, you're going to want to prepare a screening worksheet. We'll talk about that quite a bit later. So you want to be consistent throughout your screening process. And I've always worked in big corporate environments where the idea of um, legal liability is very important. And a lot of smaller companies don't really think about that. But if you use different criteria to judge various candidates, you can could end up subjecting your employer to some kind of liability if you're not asking the same questions and treating everyone the same way. So it's really important to be consistent and treat everyone the same way. And the screening worksheet really helps you to do that. It kind of pushes you into a um, you know, consistent methodology so that everyone is rated using the same yardstick. Now, these are the general things that I look for. And people might think I'm being very, very harsh. But my feeling is if someone submits a resume that has typos, that's telling me that this is their best, you know, best foot forward. This is their best work. And they didn't read it through enough or really review it enough to avoid having mistakes on their resume. So if someone has a typo, to me that's kind of a you know game stopper. I just think that a resume should be letter perfect. Now you may not agree with that, you might give people the benefit of the doubt, but I just think you really need to aim for perfection in your resume. And I've confronted resumes, I've reviewed several hundred resumes, and some people just can't boil it down to two or three pages. I've seen 10-page resumes, eight-page resumes. And for me, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to look at it any further. If you weren't able to get your resume down to a reasonable length, then I just won't consider you, because I think in the real world, in day-to-day -day work, we need to be able to be succinct and have um, you know just the real important stuff in there, and if you can't get to that, then that tells me that I'm going to be reading hundred page reports and it, it's just an indicator that you're not able to um, be succinct. Um, if your formatting is really poor or like I've, I've seen resumes where the font changes from one paragraph to another or the margins are consistent. That tells me that that's the kind of document you would produce in day-to-day -day work. And then finally, people who have been in a lot of different jobs, you know, they, they're somewhere for a year and then they go to somewhere else and then somewhere else, that makes me think that that candidate is not going to be uh, there for the long term. And it's very expensive, really, when you think about it, to bring on someone, train them, get them into the culture of that company, and then have them quit. That's very costly. So you don't want to have somebody who's not going to be around for the long term. So I look for people who've been at their previous jobs for, you know, several years. And um, a lot of people have. So, anyway. so you want to um, have some criteria that you use to assess people. How long have they been doing this? So generally, I would, unless it's like a 
kind of an intern position where you're willing to take somebody right out of college. Uh, if you have a really experienced team and you're, you have the luxury of bringing on someone with no experience. Otherwise, if you really need someone who's a seasoned veteran, you should ask for like five years of experience. Having a certification is useful. Now, I've known people, and I'm sure you have too, who are certified, but they're not really competent in, in the field. That's possible, but at least if someone has a certification, you know that they have put in the time to study, take an exam, record their education units, and all that. So it just exhibits a certain level of commitment that's important, and it gives you a certain feeling of, um, you know, this person is in it. And then having done a one or more business impact analyses, that's really an important experience to have because that's such a, a foundational part of the profession. And if someone hasn't done that, um, it's, you know, it's just, it's really builds, that, that's what builds the whole program. So you really want to have that as one part of their experience. You want to have somebody who can communicate, both in writing and as a presenter. Someone, you know, who, who might have to talk to, you know, the CEO or all sorts of different levels of people. You, you want to have that as an essential skill. You want to have someone who's done a developed business continuity plan. Um, and um, you know, those are the output really of the BIA, and so that just is a natural progression from having done BIA. It's um, really in today's world most companies, at least most large companies, have tools automated tools, and you want your candidate to have used different tools. They may not be the same tools that you have, but at least they kind of know how these tools work and what value those tools have. Your candidate should have experience leading, developing exercises. Uh, and th this is not something that people just can do with no experience. It's really uh, critical that they led them, they developed them. And um, like I, I had a client recently who um, allowed kind of the business units to develop their own exercise scenarios and then participate in them. And of course they set the bar pretty low for themselves because they wanted to have a successful exercise. What you want to have is someone who can develop a scenario that's not, um, you know, undoable, but that kind of stresses people out a little bit and um, is original and is really exercising the plan. So you want someone who's done this. And usually a business continuity professional will have to give presentations to all levels of uh, the company. and so. You want to have, have someone who's comfortable public, with public speaking, who can give presentations, take questions, and really is confident in his or her knowledge. Um, and you know, everyone uses Microsoft Office. And you may not be able to tell by looking at someone's resume whether or not that person is really good at using those tools, but the resume is a kind of a view into that person's proficiency. And if the resume is not well formatted, uh, that may indicate that the person really doesn't know how to use office tools. Um, having project manager experience is a really great asset. I once hired a guy who had very limited business continuity experience, but he was a PMP, a project management professional, and he really uh, you know, understood how to manage a project. And he was able to learn the business continuity piece 
Um, and it was just great having him be able to manage, big, you know, manage our BIAs. He had a lot of skills that were very, very important. And then here are some things that are kind of nice to have. Somebody who has um, emergency management experience. Sometimes emergency management is not under the business continuity umbrella, but oftentimes it is. And even if the two programs are handled by different parts of the company, they should be well integrated. And you should look for somebody who has an understanding of emergency management. Again, IT disaster recovery uh, knowledge is, is a really um, it's a really useful thing for your um, candidate to have that. Um, I had a manager at one time who was very, very good at business continuity. He knew it backwards and forwards, but he had no IT knowledge. And there were often times when that hurt him uh, in his dealings with IT. And again, lastly, IT expertise. There has to be a lot of coordination between the business continuity group and um, the IT group because so much of so many companies now are so dependent on technology, and you just really need to have that coordination. And if you don't know the lingo and you can't communicate with IT, it's really uh, a detriment to the program. So these are very nice to have. Uh, attributes. Some might say these are essential, um, but they, they really are very, very nice to have. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the incident command system. This is a methodology for dealing with emergency events. It really came out of, um, actually it was developed in California after a large fire in the state. Um, the agencies that had dealt with it realized that they didn't have a common methodology, they didn't have the same language, the same titles, all this stuff. So they developed a common methodology that over time was adopted by the federal government and other state agencies. And you may not use it, your company may not use it, but if you have an understanding of it, if your candidate has an understanding, this means that they understand how important it is to have a consistent and systematic approach to incident management. And um, you know, you may not need to have this. It's very formal. It's got roles and responsibilities and forms. It's very complex and detailed. But just having an understanding of that tells you that this person really knows how incidents are well managed. So here are some other things to think about. Um, when I was in a position, my, in my last corporate job, my position was being, uh, well, the IT department was being uh, outsourced primarily. So I was offered a severance package, which I took. But I had a lot of time between the time I got, you know, I took the package and when I actually left. And I used that time to really work on my LinkedIn profile. I had, you know, never really paid much attention to it. And what I learned during that time was how essential LinkedIn is to networking with others and um, just being visible to other people. So your candidate, you know, you want to look at your candidate's LinkedIn profile. You want to compare that profile to the person's resume. Is it consistent? Um, you know, do they have a lot of connections? And is it well done? And that just is one more view into that candidate. And, you know, our profession is a small group of people, really. We're kind of a niche group. So if you get a resume from someone and they say, well, I worked at this place, and you know someone there, call that person up and say, did you ever work with so-and-so? What are your thoughts on that? Um, and I've learned that your network can be your friend or not. It, you know, if you've made a good impression on people, when people call up and say, you know, what, how was your experience with so-and-so, um, they can either say, oh, great, or, you know, here's what I thought. I get calls 
regularly from people asking about candidates. So it's really important to take advantage of your network. And then you want to think about, has this person involved him or herself in professional organization? And that just is another indication of their level of commitment to the profession. And, um, you know, someone may have been, you know, in, say, an ACP board member, and you may know him or her as, say, the treasurer, and they've got a great job as treasurer. You don't know how they are as a business continuity person, but you know that as the treasurer, this person did a great job. And that kind of gives you an indication of their work ethic, their ability to work in a team, and, you know, it, it says something about that, that person. So sometimes, you know, each each uh, company has its own culture, uh, what are its values, and when you're conducting the interview or looking at the resume, you kind of get a sense of would this person fit? Would the team like working with this with this person? Um, and then, what skills does this candidate bring? Uh, sometimes. You have a really great team, but you're lacking, say, an IT person or a, um, a project management person. Maybe this candidate will bring that lacking skill set into the team. So it's important to kind of see where, where that person would fit. So this is, I don't know how long you're going to be able to see this because I know it's really small. And what I'll do after we're finished, I will. Um, send this out so you can see it in you know real life. But this is a, a screen worksheet that I've used to evaluate each resume and give each resume a score. And each skill set is given a weight and then each candidate is rated. So um, you 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 know Obviously, every organization is different and has different priorities. So the weights given in, in the worksheet are really based on what's important to that organization. And you, know, you don't want to interview 20 people. So you might say that anyone who scores higher than whatever, 20, 30, whatever it is, that's your cutoff. And if you score below that, you won't be offered an interview. Um, and then, you know, there are some things that even though the person might score really high, they're lacking an essential skill that you absolutely have to have. And so you might decide, well, even though this person has all these great qualities, he or she is lacking this one particular thing that we absolutely have to have. Um, and, you know, we just can't interview this person. And then the worksheet, you really should keep it around for, you know, according to the company's retention policies. Again, because I've worked in large companies that have, um, they're very wary of being sued. They keep things and you know document everything so that you're sure that um, if someone uh, complains, well, I wasn't in, I wasn't given an interview, and I was well qualified. You have some kind of documentation that shows why you didn't choose to interview this person. So we've got quite a bit of time left, and this wasn't part of my original content, but I wanted to make sure I had content so that uh, we'd fill out the, the, the time we've set aside. So this is kind of bonus material about now you've gotten your um, candidates down to a limited number. You've, um, let's, to me, the ideal would be like four or five people. After, like I recently, for a client, uh, got 11 candidates, and we were able to pare it down to four, each of which was given an interview. And um, what you want to do is prepare a questionnaire before you do the interviews. And you want to ask each candidate the same questions for the same reasons we've talked about why you want to be consistent with the um, scanning of or the screening of the um, 
of resumes. You want to be consistent. Now, my recommendation is that you do panel interviews where you have two or three people conducting an interview together. And you kind of do a round robin. Each panelist asks some questions. Um, uh, the last candidate, the last uh, client I had didn't want to do panel interviews because she felt they intimidated the candidates. But um, I just find that it's helpful after an interview for the panelists to sit and kind of talk and reach consensus about how they felt about the candidate. But um, you know, not everybody likes that. One interesting thing in this recent uh, encounter I had with interviewing is the client had uh, her secretary, who was doing quite a bit with the business continuity program, conduct one of the interviews. She had each each of us interview individually, and there was a one of the candidates was what I and the manager thought was a really good candidate for this, and he apparently was very patronizing with the secretary, I think because she was a secretary. And she did not like this guy at all, and she would have had to work very closely with him to hand off a lot of the work. And so because he didn't treat the secretary respectfully, he didn't get another interview. So I thought that, I, I don't know if the manager deliberately wanted to, uh, you know, screen the candidate for that kind of quality, but I thought it was interesting and probably not a bad idea to have somebody who's, say, a lower level um, employee conduct part of the interviews because you may find out this person really isn't very good with people that he or she feels are, you know, lower level. So, and then, of course, during the interview, you want to take notes. You want to, um, uh, write things down because if you're interviewing a lot of people, sometimes after the interviews are over, it all kind of blurs. It's hard to remember who said what and which candidate you really like. So it's important that you take notes during the interview. And um, when I'm interviewing someone, I always encourage him or her to take notes as well. If you ask a very lengthy question or a complicated question that might, you know, you might forget what, what was the beginning of the question, encourage the candidate to take notes so that he or she can answer it completely. So here I have um, some sample questions. And these really are designed to find, and these are, I mean, I've got a lot of interview questions. So you would want to pick out a few, you know, maybe three or four. You don't want to ask 20 questions. But these are kind of the sorts of questions that you would want to ask that would enable you to really discern the person's level of experience. And you also want to kind of see what is their insight into the profession. Um, you want someone who has thought about it. They've thought about, you know, where, where is the profession going? How is it changing? Um, and I've often, well, I've often asked people during the interview to write a paragraph or so uh, if you, say, had a, um, an executive who said, uh, you know, I don't really see any value in this. How would you counter that? Write me a paragraph. And what that does is it allows you to uh, evaluate that person's writing skills and also, you know, how persuasive can they be? Because as you know as business continuity people, a lot of times we're challenged about, you know, why are we doing this? This is, you know, this doesn't seem like a valuable use of my time. So you want to ensure that you select a candidate who can really be persuasive, who can make people think about, um, you know, why we, why we do this, why it's such an essential thing for a company to have. So I think it's very important that 
a candidate understands the phases of the business continuity life cycle. Uh, that's, you know, really, I think that question is, is really essential. Um, finding out about what experiences this person has had, you know, performing business continuity projects. Um, where the profession is going and how has it changed in you know in the last several years and again convincing someone as an executive or a manager that this is an important thing for you to do um, how has how have you been challenged in the profession what things have you found difficult and you know how do you overcome those difficulties so again you wouldn't ask all these questions but this is just kind of designed to give you some ideas. Um, you'd want to know, you know, we have all these standards out there, and you really would want to know that the candidate is aware of the standards. Your company may not embrace a particular standard, but just an awareness of the fact that there are standards, that some companies conform to them, you would want to, you know, have a candidate who knows that. Um, the BIA, what, um, what would they consider an important aspect of it? How would they do it? What are the elements of it? Uh, same thing for the risk assessment. What um, factors? To me, you know, where, where is the company located? What are the environmental elements that are uh, risks to the company? You'd want to kind of know that the, that the candidate's aware of that. Um, you'd want to find out if they've used uh, notification systems and other tools and how they evaluate those. Um, and one of the things that, as a consultant, that I've been asked to do is to go into a, a program and say, well, what's good, what's bad, what's needed. So if you know your your program you think it might have some gaps, might be uh, needing some attention in some way. How would this candidate approach analyze, analyzing the program and uh, identifying gaps and, and remediations? And I find it interesting that organizations place their business continuity function in a variety of areas. I've seen it in finance. HR, IT, corporate security, um, and I think it's interesting to see where a candidate believes that the program belongs, and um, just kind of to get a feel for what they're what what they think about business continuity and where it fits in an organization. So. If you've conducted the interview with a panel, you want to meet, like I said earlier, you want to meet together with the panelists and talk about this person, each person's performance, what you think of them, um, and kind of come to a consensus. Sometimes, you know, you surprisingly come out of an interview with vastly different perceptions of the candidate. But hopefully, by the end of your meeting with the other panelists, you have come to a consensus, and you agree on a some kind of ranking. So you may decide this person needs another look. We need to conduct a second interview, or you may decide this person just wasn't a good fit for our needs, and you know the process has ended for that. Um, but it's very important to you know that you do this fairly soon afterwards because people tend to forget. And as I said earlier, you tend to, when, you, when you're interviewing a large number of people, uh, it kind of starts blending together and you uh, forget who said what. So it's important to do this pretty much. What I recommend is when the candidate leaves, the panel stay in the room and have a discussion right there and then. I think that's the best way to do it. So that's the end of my prepared content, but I'm, you know, would welcome any questions, and uh, I'm looking to see. Uh, Molly, we've got some great questions. I, um, 
Uh, I'm going to get those okay. back to you, but I don't, I don't want to waste any time. Great presentation. Can you speak oh. to the continuity profession as a whole? Is it growing? Um, yes. I, you know, when I uh, left my job, it was about two years ago, of course I was worried, you know, am I going to be able to find work? I haven't really had a problem finding work in this. There's a growing demand for our services, our knowledge. Um, I think because so many things have happened that have made companies realize that they're vulnerable to disruption. They need to have people, and we're a very specialized knowledge set that um, you can't just take somebody off the street and throw them in and say you're a business continuity person. You really have to know what you're doing. So I, I really believe that our profession is just going to continue to grow. Okay, and second half of that question, what can one expect in a compensation package? Um, well, I think it really depends on your location. Um, I Here in Southern California, you know, it's a high cost of living, high housing costs. I had a client recently who was looking for a highly experienced business continuity professional to pretty much run the program on his or her own. And I recommended that they offer the candidate $150,000 a year. Now, that might be high if you're in some place more, you know, that's not as costly. Maybe it would be lower if you're in, like, New York City might be higher. But that was the recommendation that I gave based on what I've seen. Good. And this is a good one. Um, I'm a veteran with emergency management planning experience for a national program. Who can I look to to get feedback on transitioning or translating my experience to a corporate setting? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I would be glad to talk to this person. Um, I would recommend that, that the person be become part of ACP, or if they're not already. And just, I mean, I think most people are generous and would be glad to help uh, coach this individual um, into what kinds of training and maybe volunteer work that he or she could do in order to uh, enhance the emergency management experience. And because emergency management is, you know, a, a very important part of the overall business continuity um, profession, but it's not the whole thing. So if, if you're limited to just emergency management, you're going to want to expand into thinking about a more a broader-based business continuity perspective. And I think you should look to mentors in your ACP chapter. Um, and there are so many free webinars and other training that um, are available to us that I think you can definitely avail yourself to those. Yeah, I, I was going to jump in as well. Um, that's a great answer. Um, the the network through ACP is great. You know, it's okay, this is kind of preaching to the choir here. But um, in particular, we serve on the board with Cheyenne Marling. Cheyenne's an expert in that area. Contact her. Um, um, she's a BC management, and uh, uh, she she um, I, I can't think of anybody who would who would be able to help somebody uh, transition from, from being a veteran with that kind of experience into corporate uh, setting. Um, she would at least be able to provide you know, really good, good information. I, uh, I wanted to share, share something with you. Um, back in 1998-97, I worked for Pacific Bell, our local phone company, and um, the company was headquartered in Northern California. I was here in Los Angeles, and they decided that we all had to move to Northern California, and I didn't want to move. I was offered a severance package, and at that time, I was an internal auditor, and I was part of an organization called the Institute of Internal Auditors, which was kind of the counterpart to ACP, it was the professional organization for internal auditors, and I happened to be the local chapter president. So I went to my monthly meeting and said, hey, everybody, I'm taking a severance package, and I need to find another job. And within a week or so, I had three job offers. Not because these people knew I was a good auditor, but they knew I was a good volunteer, that I did the work that was needed uh, for 
our little organization. And so I didn't join the organization in order to have uh, job offers, but when that happened, I realized what a value it is to be part of a professional organization. You know, yeah. people yeah. come to know you, they trust you, and when they have an opening, they reach out to you, and they, you know, it, 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 it's just a really good thing to do uh, in case you need it for a rainy day. Yeah, yeah. A couple more questions that we have time for, and then the others we'll have to get to later. Um, Behavioral interviewing. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, the person asked, you know, how do you feel about questions where you ask, what would you do in this situation versus what did you do in in a situation where these things happened? Yeah, I, I mean, I've asked those kinds of questions. What if, you know, X happened? How would you handle that? Uh, I think that's a valid way to, you know, assess someone. and. I didn't say this during the presentation, but I have to say that my experience, I've probably interviewed a few hundred people, and I've come to realize that within the first five minutes of the interview, you kind of know, is this person a good fit or not? Just the way the person conducts him or herself, or the way, uh, just you get a feel for it. And um, sometimes I overlooked that, and said, oh, well, you know, I have this funny feeling, but let's go ahead and hire this person. And later it came back, yeah, you know, my initial feeling was correct. So trust your gut. I mean, that's not, doesn't sound objective or professional. But there's probably something um, there that's, you're, you can't define it, but there's something that you're sensing that's probably valid. And, you know, trust yourself that if someone doesn't feel like they're going to be a fit, they probably aren't. So, so the last question, I think you'll, it'll resonate with you because it does with me. Uh, you and I are both veterans of the utility industry, electric utility industry. One of the few places where you, you at least used to be able to get a pension. Um, and it's very rare now, uh, more and more so uh, as time goes on. And yet you still occasionally hear folks talking about, you know, recommending that their kids go somewhere where they get a pension. Most of that's government now, of some sort, military, government, um, you know, law enforcement. There's a number of fields, but but in the general world, uh, you know, 401ks and portable portable retirement plans are the more the norm. And the reason is you hit on this in your presentation earlier. I'm just expanding on the question. Um, you talked about people who only stay on the job for a couple of years and then move on. Um, and I think what you're alluding to, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Is, is that we see more and more of that with with millennials and with y younger folks uh, who are uh, new into the business and they want to learn what they can learn and move on to, to get another opportunity, something challenging, and get more you know more experience. Some large companies allow for that within without having to leave the company. You can move within a company and go from different roles, and that's a that's a great opportunity. But um, how, how do you manage that uh, in the interview process in terms of, you know, sometimes that's not a, a bad thing when someone is ambitious and eager and wants to learn um, and won't stay if they're in a position where, they're, okay, I've done everything I can here and there's nothing more to learn and you're not giving me any additional opportunity. That would seem like a good person to have, but, but how do you manage that from the interview process? Well, I think, um, you know, kind of, asking the person what their goals are going forward and comparing those to what the job expectations are. So if someone's goal is, you know, I want to be CEO within five years or, you know, something like that where you realize this is a mismatch. This person's uh, not going to fit in. And I think their job history is, the be you know, their past is the best predictor of their future. And if someone's jumping from job to job, um, and I, I've done a lot of interviewing of people in the information security field where, you know, it, you get a lot of job hopping, a lot of young, mostly guys who go from company to company. And you're not as concerned about it in that area because information security is kind of generic. If you know it at one company, you probably know it at another company. Whereas business continuity, you have to know a lot more about that particular company in order to be effective. 
so I think that getting somebody who you know is is just looking to go on to the next job within a couple of years, that's not a good match for what a business continuity group needs. I think you need people who want to want to stay around for a while because there's so much. It takes you a long time to learn about the company, and if you have somebody who's not going to stay, it's really, you know, like I said in the presentation, it's very costly to have to start over again with somebody else. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you everybody for attending the program and webinar. And if you would, please stay on the line for 30 more seconds. Don't make me come over there. Um, but we have some good information for you. Before that, uh, I, I want to thank Molly uh, for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I also, again, like to thank ADG and their webinar experts for supporting our series. And again, Continuity Housing for sponsoring the entire ACP webinar series. And do remember to visit continuityhousing.com or leave a comment in the survey if you're interested in how they can provide your critical employees guaranteed housing when they need it most. Be sure to watch the ACP website for future webinar information as well as your email. Um, and as a reminder, this and previous webinars are, are recorded, made available to uh, members on the ACP website. Um, we'll check after the, the webinar. We usually are able to post the slide deck, but we'll, we'll talk to Molly and see if we can do that here. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Uh, it's a couple things involved there. And finally, yeah, a very sure that, good Yeah, pardon me? Yeah, I'd be glad to um, post the, the presentation. Great. Great, okay. And finally, a very brief survey about this webinar will pop up when you close your browser. So if you would, please take half a minute to answer the questions. That really helps us refine our productions for you. Thanks, and have a great day.